Chapter 17. Crazy. Kerry and James crawled out of the road and lay in the grass verge behind the bus stop, catching their breath. As kickings go, it hadn't been bad, but they'd have plenty of bruises in the morning. I guess they wanted us fit enough to walk home and give Keith his message, Kerry said. How's your knee? James asked. I'm okay. Your lip's bleeding. You feel up to walking, or do you want to rest for a minute? I can walk, Kerry said. What are we going to do? Exactly what the man with the gun told us to do, James said. It'll take at least an hour to get into town. Or if we pass a phone box that works, we can call home and reverse the charges. This will ruin the mission, Kerry said. Nah, I'll just explain what happened to Kelvin. It's obvious we've been set up. What if they think you were in on it? Kerry asked. There's plenty of delivery boys. If there's any doubt, KMG will just dump you and use someone else. James realised she was right. Oh, they're not exactly going to be happy about me losing 300 grand worth of coke, are they? They'll check all of us out, Kerry said. Not just you and me. Kyle, Nicole, Hewitt and Zara will be under the spotlight as well. The whole mission will be down the toilet. I don't see how we can get the drugs back, James said. That guy had a gun. I don't even have trainers. He was small time, Kerry said. What makes you say that? You heard what the skinhead said when he took your trainers. That hairball was paying them by letting them keep our stuff. That's hardly the motives of a big shot. Okay, James said. He's small time, but he's still got a gun. He won't kill us in a million years, Kerry said. He's been paid a few hundred quid to scare us, grab the drugs, and send a message to Keith Moore. There's a huge difference between that and murdering two kids. Supposing you're right, James said, how do we find this guy? I think there's only one road in and out of this chunk of paradise, and we haven't seen him leave. We're looking for a tall, fat drug dealer with tons of curly hair and a beard. I bet one of the scumbags hanging around here will be able to put a name to a description like that. And we just walk up and they'll tell us? Kerry shrugged. We'll make some excuse why we need to find him. The thing is, James said, if you've just ripped off KMG for 300 grand, you won't be hanging around here for long. I know, Kerry said, but he doesn't think KMG will know what's happened until we get into town. He'll be off his guard for the next hour or so. You're serious, aren't you? James smiled. I'm really going to go chasing after some gun-toting drug dealer in my socks. I think it's worth the risk, but I'm not forcing you. If you're not up for it, we'll head home. James thought for a second as he dabbed his bloody lip on the bottom of his t-shirt. He didn't fancy their chances. If it had been anyone but Kerry, he would have said no. Let's go and get shot, he said, climbing to his feet and taking his first painful steps since the beating. They cut around the back of the shops, dodging the snooker club in case anyone inside spotted them. They found a couple of skinny women at the bottom of the staircase and got blank stares when they described the hairball. They got lucky on their second attempt when Kerry described him to a group of teenagers. Was it some kind of heavy metal t-shirt? Yeah, Kerry said. Do you know where we could find him? He dropped his keys outside the snooker club and we picked them up. Sounds like Crazy Joe, one kid said. He lives in Alhambra House. You want to be careful. He's a serious lunatic and he's drugged up half the time. You know where exactly? James asked. (laughs) What do I look like? The kid laughed. Directory inquiries? Try the second or third floor. Cheers, James said. Nice socks, the kid replied. Alhambra House was the furthermost block. There were 20 flats on each floor, but finding the right one was easier than they expected. Loads were boarded up, and most of the others didn't look the part. Old person style wallpaper in the hallways, or ethnic names written under the doorbells. Joe's flat turned out to be a giveaway. The front door was painted black with a devil's head knocker and underneath the word Joe's was written in Tipex. They peered through the glass. There was an Aerosmith poster pinned to the kitchen wall and all the lights were on. James and Kerry didn't have their lock guns or anything with them. They couldn't get in, so they had to lure Crazy Joe out. Check he's at home first, Kerry said. Ring the bell and run. 
James pressed the buzzer and they sprinted to the end of the balcony and hid in the stairwell. Crazy Joe waddled onto his doorstep in his t-shirt and boxes and looked down the balcony. He swore about bloody kids and went back inside. So now what? James asked. If he's half undressed, he's probably home alone. There might be a girlfriend in there as well. I don't reckon any woman lives in that house, James said. Based on what? Kerry asked. Did you see the filthy sink and cutlery piled up on the draining board? James asked. That's a single man's kitchen, if ever I saw one. There's something messed up about this, Kerry said. You'd think he'd be running or driving someplace in a hurry, not sitting around in his underwear. None of this makes any sense, James said. Everything else I've done for KMG has run like clockwork. Joe might have friends nearby, Kerry said. We need to take him down quickly and without making a noise. Five minutes later, Crazy Joe emerged from his flat a second time to find James grinning at him. I warned you, Joe sneered. As Joe lunged for James, Kerry landed her hardest punch into the side of his head. It hit the sweet spot above the eye socket where the skull is thinnest, giving Joe's brain a good rattling. All his muscles went limp, and James had to dodge out of the way as he slumped across the balcony. Get moving, Kerry said anxiously, looking at James. He'll start coming around in no time, and I don't want to have to knock him out twice. James stepped over Joe and ran into the flat, checking inside every room to make sure nobody else was home. There were pizza boxes and rubbish everywhere. The smell of stale cigarette smoke made his eyes water. Once he knew the flat was empty, he helped Kerry drag the semi-conscious Joe through to the living room. Find something to time up with, Kerry shouted. James ripped the electric cables out of the back of the video and the satellite box. Joe struggled a bit, but they managed to knot the flax tightly around his wrists and ankles. Where's our drugs, Joe? Kerry asked, bunching her fist in the air above him. How old are you guys? Joe grinned. 13? 14? Nearly 13, James said. I've seen it all now, Joe said. You guys were supposed to get scared and run home to mummy. Shut it, Kerry said in a firm voice. From now on, you talk when I say so, and you better make sure I like the answer. So, for the second time, Joe, where are our drugs? Found them, James said, spotting the two backpacks beside the couch. He unzipped them, making sure the stuff was still inside. Look for the gun, and anything else you don't want him coming after us with, Kerry said. She kept Joe under control while James searched the flat. The shotgun was inside Joe's leather jacket, hanging up by the front door. James found a pistol and more drugs under the bed. It was cocaine in one gram bags, identical to what James delivered most nights. He'd been trained where to look for hidden stuff, and an uneven piece of skirting was a dead giveaway. James pulled it off and found two supermarket carrier bags stuffed with more cocaine and a few thousand pounds in scrunched up cash. James stuffed the drugs into the carrier bags on top of the money and carried the lot into the living room. Shall we take all this? James asked. Why not? Kerry said, smiling. He made us suffer. We better not hang around here, James said. Oh, you kids are in way over your heads, Joe gasped. Kerry bunched up her fist. Did I ask for your opinion? She grabbed a wad of serviettes out of a greasy pizza box and forced them into Joe's mouth. Are we going to call a cab or what? James asked. Kerry pointed at a picture on the wall. Is that parked around here somewhere? James looked over his shoulder at a framed photo of a slimmer, younger Joe standing in front of an American car. It was a fancy two-seater with mad-looking air scoops on the bonnet and a two-tone orange paint job. James read the little gold plaque stuck on the frame. 1971 Ford Mustang Mach 1, tuned to 496 horsepower. They look like car keys on the coffee table, Kerry said. Joe wriggled his arms and furiously tried to shout something through the serviettes plugging his mouth. James grinned as he picked up the keys. Sure beads hanging around for a minicab to turn up. Where's it parked? You wouldn't leave that on the street around here. It must be in one of the garages out the back. Kerry pulled the soggy wad of tissue out of Joe's mouth. What's your garage number? If you touch my car, Joe gasped, 
spitting bits of white fluff off his tongue. You're both dead. Kerry smashed her trainer into Joe's guts. Next time, it'll be your balls, Kerry shouted as Joe groaned in agony. What's your garage number? No way, Joe grunted. James, Kerry said sweetly, hand me the gun, please. James passed it across. Kerry pulled down on the stock to load it and pointed the sawn-off barrel at Joe's knees. The next word out of your mouth had better be a garage number, Kerry snarled, or it's going to take a miracle to get the blood stain out of this carpet. James knew Kerry wouldn't pull the trigger, but she put on a good act, and Joe wasn't so confident. 42, Joe said. How hard was that? Kerry said. And if you're lying... I'll come back here in a minute and blow off your foot before I ask again. Okay, okay, Joe gasped. I lied. It's in number 18. Why don't you call a cab? It's a very powerful car. Do you kids even know how to drive? Don't worry yourself about that, James said. All cherub agents are taught to drive. It's essential to be able to escape on wheels if things turn nasty. Why don't you take a pair of Joe's trainers, Kerry asked. Too big. James said. They'll be like clown shoes on me. We better rip the phones out, Kerry said. We don't want him calling his pals before we're well on our way. She pulled the phone out and kicked the socket off the wall with her heel. James pocketed Joe's mobile and demolished the extension in the bedroom. Kerry grabbed both backpacks. Ready to go? She asked. James got the carrier bags with the money, pistol and Joe's drugs. They went out of the front door and walked briskly along the balcony down the stairs and around to the garages at the back. Kerry's head was spinning so fast, she never noticed that she still had the shotgun in her hand. The padlock sprang open and James noisily rolled up the metal door of garage number 18. The Mustang looked better than the day it had come out of the showroom, 35 years earlier. Crazy Joe had spent serious money on it. Bags I'm driving, James said, unlocking the driver's door and lowering himself into the leather seat. Kerry didn't care. She wasn't into cars. James moved the seat as far forward as it would go so he could reach the pedals. He'd learned on the private roads around campus in a little car with an engine the size of a thimble. He wasn't prepared for the thunderstorm when the tuned V8 blasted to life, juddering through the pedals into his soft feet. Holy mother, James grinned, searching for the headlight control. The road ahead lit up and the dials on the dashboard turned electric blue. James put the automatic gearbox in drive and rolled the gargling beast out of its pen. The first couple of kilometres were dodgy. The car had big acceleration, but the brakes had much less bite than on a modern car. It caught James out when he nearly went into the back of someone at the first set of traffic lights. Once they were a few kilometres clear, he parked. Kerry found a road atlas under her seat and worked out the route home. By the time they got onto the motorway, James was feeling confident. When the road ahead was clear, he couldn't resist slamming the accelerator and taking it up to 110 miles an hour. The trim inside the car started to shake, and Kerry started going bananas. Really sensible, James, she shouted. Two kids in a stolen car carrying drugs and guns. I tell you what, why don't we attract lots of attention by slaughtering the speed limit? After seeing the way she dealt with Joe, James decided it might be best if he slowed down. They parked the stolen Mustang at the back of a DIY store about a kilometre from Thornton. It was gone 11 o'clock, and now the adrenaline rush had worn off, James and Kerry felt like they could sleep for 20 hours. We could leave the keys in the door and someone will nick it, James said. It's got our fingerprints all over, Kerry said. Joyriders usually burn cars out. If we don't want it to look suspicious, that's what we'll have to do. James gave the car an admiring glance. Seems a shame to kill it. Kerry leaned inside and flipped open the glove box. She found Joe's cigarettes and lighter, then tore pages out of the road atlas and screwed them up into loose balls. When there was a mound of paper on the passenger seat, she flicked the lighter and set the edges alight. They left the passenger door open so the fire could breathe, then ducked into some trees and waited until they were sure the flames had taken hold. The front seats were quickly ablaze. Once the roof lining caught, the flames flashed into the back. The whole interior glowed orange and smoke started curling out from under the hood. Better run, 
James said. There's bound to be a security guard around here somewhere. They'd only gone 100 metres when the heat blew out one of the back tyres. A few seconds later, the fuel caught and the back end of the car went up in a fireball. It was less than a kilometre home, but they were feeling their injuries and the walk seemed to take forever. James had a pounding headache. When they staggered through the kitchen, Ewart jumped up from the table, surprised by the state they were in. He made them both hot drinks and sandwiches while Zara and Nicole cleaned up their cuts and bruises. Shower and go to bed, Zara said after they'd explained what had happened. Don't bother getting up for school in the morning. You both need a good day's rest. I better ring Calvin first, James said. Okay, Hewitt said. Do that while Kerry's in the shower, then go straight to bed. Chapter 18 Risks James was out as soon as he hit the pillow, and the next thing he knew, it was 10am the following morning. He had six huge bruises, a couple of grazes, and a giant scab on his bottom lip. When he stood up, his thigh muscle felt tight, and he could only manage short steps. Down in the kitchen, Joshua was on the floor playing with some magnets he'd pulled off the fridge door, and Kerry was at the table in her nightshirt. She looked shell-shocked. Sleep okay? James asked. Not bad, Kerry said. Zara just made a pot of tea, if you want some. James poured a mug and got a bowl of cereal. I can't believe all we went through last night, Kerry grinned. If I didn't hurt in ten places, I might believe it was all a dream. Same here, James smiled. You were so tough on Crazy Joe when you had him tied up. I know you've got a temper, but I've never seen you juiced up like that before. I was so angry, Kerry said. I mean, what kind of scuzzball pays skinheads to beat up kids? At least Kelvin seemed cool when I explained how we got the drugs back. And we saved the mission. Zara stepped in from the garden and threw an empty laundry basket down beside the washing machine. She'd heard James's last line. You know, she said, sometimes a mission isn't worth saving. What? James gasped. Kerry looked surprised as well. I respect what you two did last night, Zara said. You made a decision under tricky circumstances and it came off. But you and I both feel you should have come home. It was an unacceptable risk going up against a man with a gun. James and Kerry both looked wounded. There's no need for those faces, Zara said. She picked Joshua off the floor and sat him on her lap at the table. Cherub is one of the most secret organisations in the world. Zara explained. Only two people in the British government know it exists, the intelligence minister and the prime minister. When politicians first find out about Cherub, they're usually queasy about putting kids in danger. Then Mac explains about all the useful work Cherubs do and the lengths we go to to make you guys safe. Imagine if you two had been hurt, or even killed, last night. Mac would have had to go to London to explain the facts, Two kids got mugged and went chasing after an armed drug dealer. At the least, Mac and the senior people within Cherub would be sacked for letting something so irresponsible happen. The politicians might even decide they can't stomach what Cherub does and shut the whole show down. Kerry nodded. When you put it like that, I can see it wasn't worth it. Sorry, James said. You've got nothing to be sorry for, Zara smiled. Just try to be less gung-ho from now on. Calvin rang James's mobile around midday. I've been making calls about what happened, he said. Can you meet us down here at the boxing club and bring everything you got off Crazy Joe with you? I'm not in shit, am I? James asked. No, no way, Calvin said. I just want you to fetch the stuff down and we'll see you right. And that bird you had with you. Kerry, James said. Yeah, bring her as well. Kerry had never been up to the boxing club. The gym was quiet at this time of day, just a few of the more serious boxers putting themselves through punishing workouts. Ken, as always, sat in his chair holding a mug of tea and watching everything that happened. They're using my office, he said. Knock before you go in. A gigantic man in a suit and tie stood guard at the door of the dingy office. James did a double take when he got inside. Crazy Joe was leaning against the back wall, he had a blood-stained dressing over a cut in his forehead. 
Kelvin sat on a cabinet off to one side, and the big cheese himself was in the cracked leather chair at the desk. Take a seat, Keith Moore said. He didn't look like anyone special. A small-ish man with cropped brown hair. He wore Levi's and a white polo shirt. The only conspicuous sign of wealth was a chunky gold ring. I haven't had the pleasure before, Keith said, reaching over and shaking James and Kerry's hands. Have you brought everything you took off Joe? James rattled the carrier bags between his legs. It's all in there. I take it you know who I am? Keith asked. Yeah, James said. I've seen you at your house. I was on the PlayStation with Junior. My business runs itself these days, Keith said. People go off to South America to buy stock. Stock arrives. Stock gets distributed. James noticed that he never referred to drugs or cocaine in case the room was bugged. Keith continued. Sometimes I go for weeks hearing the same message. All the usual problems, boss, but nothing we can't handle. Then, just when you think nothing is ever going to excite you, something turns up like what you two did last night. It was a test, wasn't it? Kerry asked. That's right, Keith smiled. You won't last long in business without loyal people. The best way to find out what they're made of is to give them some fake merchandise and put them in a situation like we put you two in last night. Some people get scared and turn hysterical. Those are the ones who will cause problems if they get busted. We have to kick them out. Some people are sorry for losing the merchandise, but they tough it out and beg for another chance. That's what we're hoping for. Guts and determination. Until last night though, Nobody ever showed enough guts to hunt down and get revenge on the guys we paid to rob them. What you two did was very impressive. James and Kerry both smiled. This is all nice and cosy, Crazy Joe said bitterly. But what about my stuff? Yes, Keith said. You'll have to return what you took from Joe. What about us? James said. I've lost my best trainers. We both lost our watches and mobiles and stuff. Joe can return them, Keith said. Joe cleared his throat. <clears> throat> um, actually, I said the two guys who duffed them up could keep what they took. Okay, Keith said. Take 500 quid out of Joe's money. That'll cover it. Well, that's a bit steep, Joe said tersely. It's not my fault the brat was wearing expensive trainers. Keith repeated himself. Take 500 quid out of Joe's money. That'll cover it. He didn't change his tone or anything, but Joe knew his place and didn't push the argument. James took 500 pounds and split it with Kerry. After that, he slid the carrier bags over to Joe. Is that everything you took? Keith asked. James nodded. Everything. Where's my Mustang parked? Joe asked. James and Kerry looked awkwardly at each other. We were scared you'd report it stolen and our fingerprints were all over the inside. James said. You didn't clean them off with white spirit, did you? Joe asked. White spirit dries out the leather. No, we didn't, James said. We, uh... He didn't have the bottle to say it. We burned the car out, Kerry blurted. You did what? Crazy Joe shouted, lunging over the desk and grabbing James by his t-shirt. Let him go, Keith said firmly. I'll kill these little pricks, Joe shouted, dragging James across the desk and trying to get his hands around his throat. James thrashed about, trying to push Joe off. Joe had ignored Keith's order, so Keith gave Kelvin the nod. Joe was no match for the powerfully built boxer. Kelvin picked up the fat man like he weighed nothing, banged him against the wall and slapped him around the face. Joe let out a high-pitched yowl that could have come from an eight-year-old girl. <laughs> car was my baby, he sobbed. I spent months working on her. Calvin backed off with a stunned look on his face. Joe dabbed up tears with the end of his beard. Wasn't it insured? Keith asked. It's not the point, Joe sniffled. I invested love in that car. You'll never get that back. Keith was killing himself laughing. <laughs> Joe, it's only a car. Get a grip on yourself. Those kids should pay damages or something. They shouldn't get away with it. 
Joe, Keith said, looking a little angry. It's not my fault you let yourself get outwitted by two 12-year-olds. I've done what you wanted, now get out of here before I ask my minder to step inside and knock your head through the wall. Joe grabbed his carrier bags and stumbled out of the office. He looked such a shambles James almost felt sorry for him. Keith got up from behind the desk, shaking his head. You know, Keith said, as Kelvin helped him into his overcoat, you two kids stay loyal and work hard. You're going to make a lot of money. James and Kerry both grinned. The bruises were worth it if they'd earned Keith Moore's respect. Actually, Kerry said, I came along as a favour to James. All your deliveries are done by boys. I thought girls were soft until I met you, Keith said. I can set her up, if you like, Calvin said. These two are really special, Keith said, grinning. They've got brains and balls. Keep them busy and make sure they're properly rewarded. Thanks, Kerry said. And James, Keith said, if you're over my house with Junior any time, be sure to stick your snout into my office and say hello. Keith left with his minder like he was in a hurry. James looked at Calvin, who was shaking his head in disbelief. I'm going to have to treat you two right, Kelvin said. With Keith singing your praises, I might just end up calling one of you boss someday.